It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Ben Kushner. Hey, Ben, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Thanks for the invite. So, you're an author. Uh, you got some books out. Shattered Lion. Uh, Shattered Lion Volume 2 is the one we're going to be talking about in a bit. Uh, how many books have you written? Um, so far, Shattered Lion, the duology, so the two books are the only ones in the series. Those are my only books. I've been working on a series of fantasy novellas, but that's not really come to fruition yet, and I haven't really gotten into the publishing details with that. But yeah, so Shattered Lion Volume 1 and Shattered Lion Volume 2 are currently my only published book. Okay. Did you self-publish them, or did you get a traditional publisher? Um, I went for self-publishing for my first round, for um, my first dive into the publishing industry, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Amazon uh, Kindle, yeah? Yeah, so um, it's on Amazon Kindle. I also did wide ebook distribution to Barnes & Noble, Kobo, that kind of thing. And then I've been selling print copies off of my personal website, bensbookshack.com. Okay. Let me ask you something about that, because I'm starting to venture into the... Uh the publishing world myself, I just wrote a very short book, which wasn't long enough for the publishers to take. So I have to put it up as an ebook. But uh, mm -hmm. do you find more sales with your ebook or with the traditional like real book? Um, I find more sales with a traditional book. And I think that that kind of makes sense. Because as a reader myself, I prefer to sort of have something in my hands, when it comes to marketing and promoting books, you can offer things like having a signed copy and things like that, which don't really have the same allure if you can't do that with an ebook. So um, I definitely find more sales with print copies, but ebooks, because I have wider distribution with that, it's easier to get things like reviews and it's sort of there's different sort of marketing techniques that you can use for an ebook versus a print copy but I definitely find that especially with my targeted readers the people I've been talking with on my podcast that print copies are a lot um, are much preferred okay well it's interesting because actually it sounds like both are a good way to go because they have different diff they, they net different results and I think mm -hmm. combined and, together yeah yeah and I think that um it, it's very simple to the actual mechanics of publishing an ebook are simple as long as it's, you know, well edited and you put in the work to have a good product. And so I think that if you can do an ebook that you should do an ebook, but if you are thinking of publishing, having print copies can also add a certain level of like validity because people do have that ability to have a print copy in their hands. If they want to do a review on their social media, they can, you know, take a picture of the book and you can have people being like, hello, I just bought this book by my friend and look, he signed it for me and that kind of a thing. I sent this one copy of this thing I just wrote to a friend of mine who's a publisher and he laughed and he said, this isn't a book, this is a pamphlet. And uh, <laughs> so he said, you can only do that on, on ebook because it was only 7,000 words, which is way too short mm -hmm. for, for any publisher. So I don't know. We'll figure it out. Can I ask you how old you are? Um, I am 18. 18. Okay. Well, let's see. You're, I was just trying to figure out if you were going to be the youngest guest I've had on the show. But nope. I had one who was 17, uh -huh. aspiring rock star. So, okay. Um, I've well, been beaten. Pretty close, but <laughs> anyways. Okay, so you get a book, Shattered Lions, uh, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Why don't you tell us a little about the book? So, um, Shattered Lion is a thriller in sort of a comparable style to David Baldacci, who is the author who I read the most as a young 
kid, so naturally you can see sort of the writing style that he uses in a lot of his books reflected in my own work. It follows the story of Jan van Rijn, who is a professional Dutch soccer player who's sort of living the life. He's sort of moved past a lot of the trauma that he had in his childhood, and he's managed to channel that into playing soccer. But when he's in the United States um, visiting his older sister Anya, everything changes with her sudden and violent kidnapping. So you go from this sort of simple sports story, this family story, into this dramatic, fast-paced thriller. And just as you feel like, oh my gosh, what is happening? Jan also feels the same way. So he's having to navigate this world of espionage and backstabbing and in order to find his sister. And so he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know which alliances he should make and which ones he should keep. And so it follows this story of him trying to find his sister, but also trying to figure out what are these issues that are going on in the world? How can I be part of solving them? How can I be part of stopping the quote unquote bad guy? How can I make sure that my world doesn't fall apart even as his family has fallen apart with the kidnapping of his sister. Oh, it sounds great. Sounds like it make a great movie as well. Well, if there's any <laughs> movie producers listening, I agree. <laughs> uh, David Baldacci, I'm, I'm glad I heard that name because he's been on my show twice. He's a great guy. I love talking to him. And I think he's one of the better writers out there. So I'm happy you're reading his, his work. His, I've read a couple of his books. They're just fantastic. Yeah, they're just edge of your seat. It continues to move. But in addition to having that high-paced thriller impact, you can also see that the books are character-led instead of just plot-led. The books, um, the characters are not just an avenue through which the plot happens, but they actually drive the plot with their choices, with their actions with their relationships with each other. And so that was what I really wanted to do. I saw that you could entertain people while also telling a story about the connections between people. Yeah, that's very true. Let me ask you something about the uh, the craft of writing. Uh, there is certainly an art to story creation. The, the pure artistic creating something out of the ether and, and making it tangible by writing it down on paper. But once you get the story, there is a real craft and a technique to which words you use, to which way you're going to go with the, the plot, how you describe scenes, all of that. Do you find that the more you do it, the better you get? Or do you get frustrated at certain points when you're writing and get stuck and, and need to do something else? Or how has it been for you? I mean, in terms of growth as a writer? Well, so as a younger person who's writing, I'm obviously still developing. Shattered Lion 2, which I wrote mostly this year, is better than Shattered Lion Vol Volume 1, which I wrote in my earlier high school years. And so I find that in terms of development and growth as a writer, I have to be very tactical about it. I have to be growing intentionally instead of just trying to write everything and grow maybe a little bit more... I don't want to just have the growth come upon me through writing. I want to develop in certain areas. And so I think there's sort of three keys to it. You want modeling in order, so you want to have someone to model yourself on. You want to read lots of books so that you understand which techniques work, which ones don't. You need feedback, so you need good editors, you need good teachers, you need good mentors, you need people who are going to tell you, you know what, I don't think that this action scene makes that heart racing, or I don't think that this relationship is developed well. It doesn't feel authentic. And then finally, you need to practice. And that sort of goes back to the crux of the question with, as you do it more, do you get better? Definitely. And you need to be tactical in terms of how you practice, especially as a younger person who is not just a writer, but if you're a creator in any other medium, so one of the problems that I had when I was writing Shattered Lion Volume 1 was action scenes. I wasn't very good at staging them, so they seemed kind of chaotic. You weren't really sure where all the characters were in relation to one another. So I 
through reading, I discovered that there were authors that did that staging very well. I got feedback from my editor that that was something that I wasn't doing very well. And then I practiced it. I would write six or seven just random action scenes with random characters and just work on making sure that all of the characters' positions in relation to each other were known. And so I practiced that, and I got better at it, and now I would say that action is one of my strengths. And so in term, you obviously get better through practice, but you can't just expect to continue to do the same thing. You need to figure out exactly how you need to adapt, and then you need to practice that in order to sort of hammer that home. I know that you have a lot of musicians in your audience, and it's the same way with learning an instrument. I mean, I studied viola with a classical music teacher for most of my life. I started when I was five years old, and you're not just going to play the same piece over and over again and expect to get better. You need <laughs> to true. isolate the measures that are most difficult. You need to figure out, oh my gosh, I am going sharp on this shift every single time, so am I going to need to use a different guide finger or something like that? So you need to be very tactical in terms of how you do it, or else it's going to be a lot harder for you to be able to perfect that. Well, I think that's a great answer, and it's actually very similar to what David said. Um, when I asked him about writing, because obviously he's a very well-established uh, author at this point. And I said, you know, can you've got basically carte blanche to write whatever you want. The publishers will take anything you give them because it's got your name on mm -hmm. it. And I asked him, you know, how do you sort of discipline yourself? Because it would be easy just to sort of spit out another one. And mm -hmm. he said, well, he said at that point... If if I was going to be like that, he said, I should just give it up and go sell insurance. That's what he told me. Mm -hmm. He said, because it, it becomes my responsibility now, his meaning. And, and he was right. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, he's got his wife, who is probably his biggest, uh, biggest critic, he said. And if she doesn't like it, then I usually dump it and start over, is what he said. Uh -huh. So, I mean, it, but you have to have the discipline imposed by yourself because people know that he is a money-making commodity at the point where he's at. So that's great. So when I heard that from you, I thought, okay, you know, I think you're on the, definitely on the right track. You've always got to challenge yourself. And I think you have to be, on the one hand, you've got to be your biggest critic, but you also have to be your biggest fan too. And it's a funny rope, mm -hmm. it's a funny tightrope to walk. Uh, being a lifelong musician, I've had that been walking on that rope my whole life where mm -hmm. and yeah go ahead i've i've noticed that that balance is very hard to strike especially with among the younger members of the writing community and so i've talked with people on the podcast about how sometimes they think that they're just geniuses they can't be the self-critic they're like i finished a book you know my english teacher can go to hell i'm the greatest person in the world, and then a week <laughs> later, they're hit by crippling self-doubt. No one's ever going to read this. My uh, editor yeah. thinks it's crap. And so it, you do really need to strike that line between how can I improve myself? How can I become better? How can I constantly work every day to make sure that I'm doing the story and the characters and my readers the justice they deserve? But then you also need to make sure that you have the confidence that you can look at it as an achievement, look at it as, wow, I wrote this book, look at it as, uh, wow, I managed to tell this story that I needed to tell. I was itching to tell this. I was itching to share these characters with the world, and I finally did it. And so there is that line that you have to walk, and you have to walk it very delicately, or else you can fall to one side and become cocky, never grow, and then be basically selling insurance, as Baldacci said, or right. you can go to the other side and give up and not be able to share your talents with the world. Well, the one word you mentioned in that was self-confidence, and that was my biggest problem. I didn't really develop my self-confidence until I was in my 40s. It took me that long where I started out at 18 more like the kid you were talking about. I was cocky. I was arrogant. I knew I had talent. 
I was accepted to go to the American Academy of Dramatic Art in New York and study acting and was top of my class. And it just, but inside, I didn't have the kind of confidence that was necessary. And I remember being called into the counselor's office at the academy and they said, you know, we know you have talent, but unless, um, how did they phrase it? We know you have talent, but people with less talent than you are going to succeed because they have the drive, the ambition, and the self-confidence behind them. And they told mm-hmm. me that, and I was insulted. You know, it was sort of like, how dare you say mm-hmm. that to me? I realize now that that was exactly what I needed to hear, but I didn't hear it at that time. And it took me 20 years of working in some, you know, selling insurance, basically, to come back to that reality that, yeah, that's what it's all about. So I think mm-hmm. if if you can find that self-confidence and drive at 18, uh, you're doing much better because you don't have to waste all those years looking for it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I would say that that sort of self-confidence, that authentic self-confidence, not the projected self-confidence, not, not arrogance, the arrogance right. but that the actual self-confidence can often come through that growth that we were talking about. I know as a writer and a musician that there is nothing more satisfying than starting out with something that's not that good and then working hard on it and improving that same product. There's nothing as satisfying as rewriting a scene or working on something in order to make sure that your syntax is a little bit better in terms of its variance, that it's more interesting to read or to better stage that action scene and to you know finally write those lines that you know are going to bring your audience to tears. I think that those moments of growth are what can drive real self-confidence because it doesn't just say, oh, I'm relying on talent, but it's relying on the hard work that you're willing to put in in order to make the most of what talent you have well that's a good point i think as far for music though and this is where i get into arguments with people i i think the musician has to have a basic innate talent that they're born with something to start with somewhere to start i don't think you can take somebody who has zero musical ability and turn them into the next Andre Previn. I just don't think that's Mm -hmm. possible. I think with music, you've got to start with a foundation of DNA, if you will, for lack of a better word. And yeah, and because I don't think you can teach talent. I think you can teach craft. I think you can teach technique. But I do not think you can teach talent. And I don't think you can teach creativity. I would agree. I think that you can't You can't teach talent, but you can teach someone how to maximize what talent they have. That's true. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think that we all sort of have that teacher in our life, that one teacher that managed to just sort of spark whatever it was that we had within us. For me, it was my ninth grade English teacher, and then he was also my 10th grade journalism teacher, Mr. Grinfino. And I wasn't some sort of amazing like I I didn't have the innate talent of someone like Amanda Gorman per se with the ability to craft sentences that were absolutely gorgeous where the words themselves and their construction were just as beautiful as the story being told but he pushed me he didn't give me perfect scores because I was talented he told me well you I know that you have the ability to work on this, so I'm going to give you a lower score until you can figure out how to fix this certain kind of sentence construction or whatever it was that I was working on. And so he really pushed me to maximize what writing ability I had. And then because I saw myself improving, I saw my self-confidence improving. And that was where I was able to sort of dive within myself and say, now I have the ability, I have the growth, and I have the skills to really work on this book. I finally feel like I can share something with the world because I've managed to maximize what was already there. So yeah, there is there is a line between talent and hard work, and you need to have both in order to succeed. But 
yeah, I think that there's there's a baseline of talent needed to do anything in any sort of creative field. But if you don't have the hard work to maximize that, then other people are going to surpass you and you're not going to be able to do what you want to do. And as a creative, that should be frustrating. As a creative, <laughs> you want be. to be able yeah. to create the best you can. You want to be able to tell the story that you want to tell in the best way possible, or you want to make sure that the piece of music that you're writing is as good as it can be, because you have a very intimate and special relationship with whatever creative work that you are putting your heart, your mind, your soul, your tears into, and you want to make that as good as possible simply for the sake of that relationship between the artist and the art. And so you need to do that hard work because, you know, the world deserves your creativity. So put the work in and maximize your talent. I always find it interesting that the people who have the most built-in talent, the ones that could just get up in the morning right out of bed and sing and make the angels cry with their voice, are the ones that are the least motivated not all not all but it, it seems to be like that because they'll they'll write the most beautiful song or they'll sing the most beautiful song and then they'll go run and hide in their room and they won't do mm -hmm. anything with it where you've got these other people who sing and you're like yeah okay oh, yeah that's all right but they're out there working they're hustling they're on every social media platform engaging with their fans I mean, they're just doing 110% work. And the guy who, you know, has the voice that makes the angels cry, and he's not doing anything, he's not getting anywhere. It's like the talent, mm -hmm. there's just too much stuff on the internet. I do blame the internet partially for this. Because there's just too much mm -hmm. content out there now. That even if you're the greatest singer in the world, you've got to really hustle now because there's so much mediocre stuff out there that you've got to get your head above the waterline first. And that takes mm -hmm. some, some marketing. That's just plain and simple PR. And that's very interesting, especially in the publishing industry, because anyone can self-publish anything nowadays. It doesn't need to be well edited. It doesn't need to be proofread. It doesn't need to say anything, because you can just upload it to Amazon KDP, and as long as you have the... The format. formatting skills necessary <laughs> yeah. to make it right. <laughs> to have the algorithm accept it you're you're in but so it, it's interesting because it, it is difficult for young people like myself to break into the traditional publishing industry so on one hand self-publishing is a gift from the gods because it means that you don't need to have some sort of massive platform in order to get your name out there in order to get that book in people's hands, into onto the internet, whatever it is that you want. But on the other hand, because of self-publishing, the market is so saturated. It's a double-edged sword. It's just so yeah. difficult to break through. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword, exactly. Yeah, same with music. Exactly the same with music. The same phenomenon has happened. And to some degree uh, in the indie film industry. But you know, indie film has been a little bit less affected where technology really influenced indie film was just the actual ability to make the film with digital imaging. Mm -hmm. Because before that, uh, nobody could afford 16 or 35 millimeter film in the processing. And it was just too expensive unless you had a very rich daddy or a big fat wallet yourself, which most indie creators have never had. Uh, it was just impossible to make the film. But with music mm -hmm. and with publishing, yeah, I suspect that it's uh, pretty much the same oversaturated market. And you're right. I mean, I've read some ebooks that were just laughable. I mean, misspelling and bad grammar, the whole bit, which would never be uh, something that you would get from a traditional publisher. They just would have, you know, mm -hmm. either thrown that in the bin or had it fixed one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And on the opposite end of things, I've read self-published books that were absolutely astounding. That were beautiful. Yeah. What, I think that, yeah. what I think traditional publishing does is it at least ensures mediocrity. It ensures mediocrity <laughs> and above, but it doesn't. It it filters out in it to, filters out total incompetence, 
And then, but sometimes they miss a couple things in terms of like that highest rung that, you know, because there's just so many creators out there that one of them is going to be that sort of diamond in the rough that, you know, maybe the traditional publishers might have passed up because they didn't have a large enough platform already, or they weren't as good at writing query letters as they were at writing novels. So there, there's, there, there's an interesting sort of dynamic there because if you were to only read things that are traditionally published, then you'll read things that are at least mediocre all the time, but you're going to miss out on a huge set of talent. But you, there's some sort of sorting that needs to be done there in order to make the standouts in self-publishing stand out from sort of the rest of the pack. Oh, I agree. In fact, with music, for me, it's completely the opposite. I don't listen to much of anything that the major labels put out. I think all the best music is indie now. Mm-hmm. You know, there isn't there isn't anybody on, except for the, the old ones that have been established for years and years on major labels. But anything that's come out recently, it just doesn't interest me. It leaves me cold. But some indie bands mm-hmm. that I've had on the show and that I work with, I mean, they're, they're fantastic musicians. So f- it's funny, that way it's the sort of the opposite, where I, I might tend to edge towards traditionally published books if I was looking for a book to read. I definitely would not be edging towards major label releases <laughs> if I was looking for some music mm-hmm. to listen to. So one thing that I found really interesting was I had a conversation with an author on my show uh, I won't mention his name, but he said that for a while during his career, he couldn't get anything published because none of his work contained dinosaurs. And I started laughing. And he, and he said mm. this was around the time the Jurassic Park came out, you know, the original one. Mm-hmm. And he said everybody was looking for dinosaur stories. And he said he couldn't get anything published because everyone was so focused on dinosaurs. Now, that's kind of the downside to the traditional publishers where a fad comes along and they're going to try to piggyback and capitalize on it. So all they're interested in is one particular subject matter. He said something to the effect of, uh, well, I'm glad I didn't succumb to writing a romance novel which included a velociraptor. And I just thought (laughs) it was funny, you know, they said, yeah, I'm happy too, because that would have really been selling out. That would have just really mm. lowered his standards because he's a fantastic writer. But uh, mm-hmm. that part you don't have to deal with with uh, indie publishing. Mm-hmm. Certainly, you can do it yourself. Yeah. yeah. In terms of traditionally publishing, trends come and go. So if you want to like sit on a manuscript for a while and wait for the trend to be just right, you could end up hitting a really big break. So there is from a creative or from a creator's perspective who wants to go into that publishing route, there still is an option. You just need to make sure that your work can sort of stand the test of time in order, if you are thinking about waiting for that, whatever trend it is that you to write, for you to, that you write in to work um, with whatever it is that you're, with, with the industry at the time. Well, yeah, I, I think he did. And, and his, the stuff that he was writing was... Uh, romantic novels, almost romantic comedies. I mean, a lot of his stuff. I think he's kind of transitioned over to screenplay writing now because the stuff that Mm -hmm. he was writing was so conducive to movies. And he sold a couple of them to some indie filmmakers. So, you know, he's doing well. Every once in a while, when I talk to him, I joke with him and I said, you know, where's that dinosaur book? Where is it? I want to read it. (laughs) Girl falls in love with Velociraptor, you know. It just would be a very funny book, I think. Uh, no, definitely. We got to wrap this up, Ben. We have just blown through a half an hour like it was five minutes, but it was great talking to you. Uh, do you have a website? I know Ben's, what is it? Ben's Bookshack? Ben's Bookshack.com, and that's where people can find Shattered Lion Volumes 1 and 2, both print copies and digital copies you can buy directly off the website. And then... If you go to the podcast page on that website, you can listen to my podcast. It's also available on most major podcast apps. So you can just um, search for Ben's Book Shack and it'll come right up. And so, yeah, that's where you can find me, um, bensbookshack.com. That's sort of 
the hub of all things um, Ben Kushner related when it comes to writing. Okay. Are you on social media? I would think. Yeah. Yes. On Instagram and Twitter at Ben's Book Shack. I'm also on Facebook at Ben's Book Shack. Instagram is sort of my main platform. So if you're looking for consistent updates on podcasts, on books and things like that, Instagram is where you should find me, but I also post a little bit on the other platforms as well. Okay. Well, we'll look for you. We like to uh, follow our guests so we can keep track of, uh, of their progress and what they've been doing. So thanks so much mm-hmm. for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Nice talking to you. Yeah, nice talking to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Douglas Coleman's Don't Do a Podcast is a dryly humorous rant about Douglas's pet peeve, the unrelenting torrent of podcasts hitting the web on a constant basis. As technology has put podcasting within the reach of anyone, many wholly unqualified people have taken the plunge. This witty polemic tries to persuade them from broadcasting their drivel using Douglas's brand of sarcastic humor. Now on Amazon, only 99 cents. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Love coffee, huh? But wait a minute. It seems like every time you finish a cup of coffee, you get all of these side effects along with it. Heartburn, digestion, upset stomach, acid reflux. As the world's first and only organic acid-free coffee, Tyler's Coffee is able to provide a healthier option in the solution for more than 100 million individuals who have sensitive stomachs or suffer from acid-related modalities. This is Tyler's Acid-Free Coffee. Coffee without the consequences. Hi, this is John Morgan, Production Supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, please welcome to The Douglas Coleman Show, James V. Irving. Hey, James, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Oh, doing fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. I see on your bio you were born and raised in Gloucester, yeah? Yeah, you got that right. I'm a uh, lifelong New Englander, although I don't live there anymore. Uh, but I was uh, from the Boston area, Hull, Massachusetts. And, um, sure, South Shore. Yeah, yeah. And I left there in 2005. Well, John Proctor is also from. So, John Proctor, my uh, fictional uh, protagonist, is also from, he's from Salem. So. Oh, okay. That makes a trio. <laughs> yeah. So um, I left there in 2005 and moved to Vegas, and I'm here now. I don't miss the cold, but I miss the change of seasons. Vegas has basically two seasons, not that hot and really hot. So it's yeah. just, it's a whole different world. To, and no trees. You know, I miss the trees. There's a lot to like about uh, the Boston suburbs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful in New England in the fall. And, you know, it's just in the water. I, I miss, I kind of miss all that. Yeah. But I don't miss the, uh, you know, eight months of winter. Like that, that I could leave behind. <laughs> That's the killer if you live up there. Yeah, true enough. Never ends. So do you still live there or you live somewhere else now? I live in Arlington, Virginia. I have lived here since college, but um, we, um, we get back to Gloucester uh, pretty regularly. You still have family there? Uh, not really family. I have a lot of friends and, you know, I'm like you, I'm drawn to the area and I'm perhaps more willing to put up with the cold than you are. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that's good to hear. So let's see. You're also, you're a criminal defense lawyer. Are you still practicing? 
I'm still practicing law. I'm, I'm no longer a trial lawyer. I am a, and have been for a number of years, a business lawyer, very boring. I do, you know, deals. Uh, but I tried cases at the beginning of my career, and many of those were of a criminal nature. Were any of the uh, cases that you handled in, uh, incorporated into your books? Yeah, um, not directly, but the circumstances and situations uh, were sometimes spotter. For example, when I was starting out, maybe in my first 10 years, I did a lot of work for, for the local topless bar. I got friendly with the guy who ran it. Don't ask how that happened, but it did. <laughs> and he started referring me um, pieces of work, and his girls seemed to be the type of people who get into various difficulties, and um, he asked me to get them out of those difficulties. And so, you know, they're somewhat colorful characters and situations, and yeah, I've used uh, some of that stuff. Did you ever see that movie with George Clooney where he played the lawyer? No, the name is, the title is coming. I don't, I don't think I have. I'll get to it. But one of the lines he said that was funny, he said, you know, we're just janitors. People make a mess and we got to go in and clean it up. And that, that seems about what you just said. Yeah. The difference between trial lawyers and business lawyers is perhaps that. You know, business lawyers are trying to make things, everybody everybody wants to get to the same end, a solution that everybody wins. Otherwise, nobody wins. In trial work, you know, it's it's a mess. And it's going to be less of a mess for one person and more of a mess for the other. That's true enough. So when did you start writing writing novels? You know, I studied writing in college. I studied English in college. And a good part of that was creative writing, which I really enjoyed. And I think I would have been a, a, a novelist from uh, day one if I could have made a living at it. Um, and I've uh, written regularly, irregularly, uh, all my life. Um, I, in the last couple, three or four years, four or five years, I decided to sort of make more of a, um, affirmative stab at it. And I've been lucky to be somewhat successful. Well, that's interesting because, um, it isn't that easy to become successful as an author. Obviously you yeah. got to have a good story. You got to be a good writer, but, uh, how did you approach this? Did you self publish to start or did you go straight to traditionally published? No, I didn't. Um, I, I think maybe the key thing for me was uh, I, I was taken on by an agent, uh, Nancy Rosenfeld, who was, was smart enough or good enough or wise enough to suggest that my novel would be a good series of novels. And I think that it was the fact that it was a series that, was, that enabled me to sell the books. All right. Well, that is very traditional yeah. to actually get an agent because I haven't heard too many authors who even have one anymore unless they they sort of have well, to get hard. successful first then they'll get agents yeah. <laughs> you know it's it's like getting a girlfriend when you're in college it's not that easy it seems right. like it should be but it's not you know uh, yeah i was fortunate and i did well or the other the other comparison would be it's real easy to get a girlfriend once you get married <laughs> Well, you must have read my book. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're single and you're looking for one, there's never one. You know, but as soon as you get married, then they all come flooding out of the, out of crawling out of the woodwork, I think it's called. Well, I haven't had that problem, and I'm not looking forward to it either. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, women, you know, women are, do, do pay a play a role in these books. Joss not married, and uh, he wishes he was, I think. Uh, but my, pro my protagonist's name is Joss, J-O-T-H. Proctor. Um, you know, you're from New England, you know the name Proctor. And, uh, oh, sure. Yeah. Joth is a nickname you sometimes hear among the old Yankee families for Jonathan. And so I stole that from an old buddy of mine with his permission, and uh, that is my guy, Joth Proctor. Uh, Proctor was Goody Proctor from The Crucible, right? Proctor is the name of people, two people who were convicted of witchcraft in 1692. Yeah, uh, that's, and they appeared in the Crucible. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, okay. and one of them was executed, and the, the, the wife who was pregnant was shunted off to uh, the coast rather than executed, and uh, she lived unhappily thereafter. But yeah, that's what happened. That was the name. So let's talk a little bit yeah. about your books. You've got friends like these and friend of a friend. And friends like these was the part one, and friend of a friend, or which one is part one? Friends like these. Yeah, friends like these is the first book. It introduces both Joff and the circle of uh, 
rather colorful and morally challenged friends that he has. And um, book two takes Joss, you know, uh, in the next next step in the direction. You want to give us a little uh, synopsis, just to kind of wet people's whistle as to what the book's going to be about? Sure. Um, these these are not whodunits. They're stories. They're sort of gritty um, stories of a, a lawyer who's a pretty good lawyer, but not a very good businessman, and he ends up taking cases that other lawyers might not want. Um, Friends Like These opens with Holly dead on the couch. Uh, no one's quite sure when she died or how she died, although it looks like it's an alcohol or drug overdose. And uh, she owned property, and either her estranged husband or her brother is going to get that property. And uh, they're both down in their luck. They both feel they're entitled to it, and they're both willing to cheat to get it, and it's worth a lot of money. And uh, Joth, being a former college teammate of the brother and best friend of the estranged husband, is kind of ensnared in this, trying to figure out how it should become resolved. Oh, that sounds interesting. Have you uh, shopped any of these uh, around for uh, for movie movie rights? You know that that process is going on right now. I'm interesting you mentioned that. I think it is. Uh, it's kind of a visual series of books, and I think the characters are good. And they're colorful and interesting, and uh, I think it could be. You know, I wrote it, of course, so what do I think? But I, I think it could be uh, has some merit as a potential um, film or you know streaming type of thing. Yeah. How precious are you about your work? And the reason I ask that is because people that I've interviewed and know who have had their novels picked up for movies tend to <laughs> have the stories uh, not quite resemble what it was that they started out writing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but they were Interesting question. paid a nice big check. So where do you draw the yeah. line in your head? You know, I know that if I was to give up the right to handle the stories and the characters, uh, that I might not like how they turn out. And the problem for me is that I've got more stories to write. And, and I, I'd like to write those stories. Um, in terms of a movie, my view is it's the it's the novelist's novel and it's the, the the director's movie. And once you give it up, you don't have any any complaint as to how it turns out. And I think that if I had the stories that I want written and I had run through um, the um, history that I've got in my mind for Joth and his friends, his, his colorful friends, then I wouldn't mind at that point giving it up to somebody else. Some people take uh, the approach that, well, okay, this one I'll give away, but this one I'm going to keep. You know, they kind of split it up in their head. Say, all right, if they want to, if they want to butcher this one and write me a nice big check, that's fine. You know, but the other one I'm going to keep for posterity's sake, and so maybe that works out well, for some people. Problem. Yeah. It's a good problem to have if you can if you can get it. Um, I think as so. As I said, yeah. I like to write the stories my way, and after that, um, if somebody wants to make some kind of movie out of it, I'm, I'm thrilled. You're okay with it. All right. So do you have a particular kind of a schedule? Like, do you approach this as a, a sort of job? Like you say, okay, tomorrow morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to start writing. Or do you just write when the mood yeah. strikes you? I think you have to be disciplined in order to do this. Um, and, and you can't simply say, I'm going to do it tomorrow, the next day, whatever, you've got to do it. It happens that I really like to do it. So uh, it's not like it is something I have to force myself to do. Um, the problem for me is I've got another job. I am practicing law, and I've got partners who um, I'm, uh, owe you know, a, a duty of uh, time and attention to, and that's important to me. But um, I don't play golf, so I'm able to, <laughs> to find... Uh, time uh, in the day, almost every day, to pursue this thing that, as I say, I really like to do. All right. Well, anything else you want to cover? I don't think so. I've enjoyed this conversation very much. Okay. Uh, give out your website, please, so people can come check you out, check out your sure. books. Sure. Thank you. It's uh, James V, like Vincent, James V. Irving, www.jamesvirving.com is the website. Uh, how long have uh, is uh, book two been out? Friends of a friend, friend of a friend. How long has that been out? Friend, friend of a friend came out, uh, I think, two weeks ago. Oh, and the okay. next one is scheduled to come out, you know, in the winter sometime. How many parts do you reckon are going to be with this one? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm sort of seeing maybe six, or there could be more. 
it's it's a situation in which I'm trying to take Joff and the other characters in a direction in which the pressure and stress on them increases and the tensions between the characters increases, and that's going to play out in some fashion, which I'm not completely sure yet how it's going to play out. Uh, when it does, I'm, I might be done with it. Well, <laughs> well, let's say six books, something like that. Six books? That could be a mini series. Well, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. I think six books is way too long for a film. I think I think you should shoot for a mini series, Netflix series. That would be great. <laughs> All right, James. Well, thank you for uh, for being on the show. It was nice talking to you, and uh, best of luck. I hope your books do well. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much.